Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of Effortless. And I am your host today, Mr. Piddle, with me, Dr. Spiegel. We are uh, back. I'm so excited to be back. So, Spiegel, can I tell you about something? Can I just tell the listeners first that I'm very sick, and I'm sorry if my voice sounds like it got thrown into a blender and vomited into your ears? Yeah, it sounds that's what it sexy. sounds like. Yeah. Well, that sounds pretty sexy to me. So I think our listeners will stick around for the whole show, no problem. Hey, we got good stuff to talk about today, guys. So deal with my voice. It's going to be a good show. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I wanted to tell you, um, I have a dream, Spiegel. I have a dream that Nintendo will turn things around and they will get third-party support back. And then I won't have to own a computer anymore. You I can just to, own you... the Nintendo system. I don't need it. I won't need anything else. Are that you is saying my that dream. Nintendo? Do you think is this gonna dream make, is possible? Nintendo is going to make such a resurgence that PC gamers and people who are part of the PC master race just gonna be like, oh no, they like throw their homemade computers out the window and they just they just play Nintendo games from for the rest of eternity. I don't think well, that's going to happen. PC gaming is for the you know the enthusiasts, the psychopaths and, is, is what I choose to call them. And the reason I own a PC is merely because. Everything, like all the third-party titles now, go multi-platform. So everything that, a lot of the good reasons to own a console are gone. Why, why own a console if you have a PC that can play those games in higher fidelity, uh, where you can get those games for less because of the wonder of Steam sales? And, I, yeah, I mean, look, Gears of War Ultimate is out on PC. Now, granted... The PC port is just awful. It's a it's it's a joke. Like for whatever reason, Batman Arkham even Knight. The, it's a joke. Star Wars Battlefront. It's comp, it's a laugh. It, it's not even worth it. I, I don't even understand why people buy AAA games on PC. But well, I digress. Uh, it, it, the issue is like you have these games coming out and you're trying to run them on a GTX 970, which is considered pretty much about as high end of a card as you can get. And you can't even maintain a solid 60 frames per second when the Xbox One hardware is a complete joke next to even like a mid-tier gaming PC these days. Like the Xbox One is so far behind the times in terms of the power it's, it has under the hood that it makes no sense. It really makes no sense for any of these AAA games that are coming out on console and PC to have poor performance on the PC. that It just means like terrible optimization. They put no effort into optimizing it because they know that PC gamers are going to buy the games anyway. So you guys, yeah. you PC gamers, are just as guilty as, of, of buying crappy games as we are. So I don't want to hear it from you anymore. <laughs> I'm just saying, um, why own an Xbox One or a PlayStation 4 if everything that used to only be able to be played on console is now available on the pc yeah so so i'll say this regarding console gaming like everyone gets really worked up about exclusives right and they're like oh i I don't want the i don't want uh the ps4 to have the like that all the ps4 games should be on xbox one they should all be available then what would the point be of buying a console or like picking any specific console over another one. I never understood that. I think exclusives are great for the industry. Yes, yes. it means you have to spend more money. Deal with it. If this is going to be your hobby, you're going to spend money. And you know what? You're going to get burned sometimes buying a crappy exclusive like Quantum Break or you know uh, uh, Mario and Luigi Paper Jam because it's exclusive to that system, but you think it looks cool, and then you get screwed because it sucks. But you know what? That's the name of the game. That's what we do, and that's why we play video games, just so we can get screwed exclusives are everything where would the xbox brand be today without the halo franchise right well we're seeing it now because nobody cares about the halo franchise anymore so the xbox one is just getting creamed i mean pretty much worldwide now what about like mario and pokemon and like the 3ds didn't do anything until those games were out on that system if mario and pokemon were on you know ps3 or you know or vita in the, or in this case or psp do you think that the 3DS would have performed nearly as well? No. Likely because, not. Yeah. So I think exclusives are very important to keep all these companies that we love alive. And I think it's a good thing that they're willing to be protective of their IP and not dilute them by putting them on other consoles. Where would, where would, the, where would the PlayStation 3 be without Killzone? Right? 
because it, uh, it, it was really no no I, i'm saying this as an example ps3 was really struggling out of the gate and then that kill zone game came out and then people finally jumped on board if i'm Killzone remembering two, correctly. uncharted 2 yeah, um and uncharted it, the, the more that the really good AAA exclusives came out on the ps3 the more it sort of turned its fortunes around well because people started realizing that the xbox 360 only had gears of war and like you know alan wake and uh Halo. viva pinata <laughs> yeah so so that was about it for xbox exclusives yeah um, but by the but since it uh released early and sort of hit hard with gears of war that really turned it or yeah turned the tides in its favor but speaking of the xbox one did you know nintendo or sorry nintendo Sorry, Microsoft. The Nintendo Xbox? We're going to talk about Nintendo later, okay. not now. Yes. Uh, Microsoft is doing another price cut for the Xbox One, a temporary price cut. Yes, the Xbox One is on sale at various retailers for $300, uh, the 500 gigabyte model. It comes with Gears of War, and at select retailers, you can get another free game with it, such as Rise of the Tomb Raider or Rare Replay or some other awesome game. Uh, both of those games, Rare Replay, Rise of the Tomb Raider, fantastic yeah um so as much as we malign the xbox one for being a, the worst literally the worst hardware ever created by a human or a robot uh at least in my opinion uh it does have some really nice games on it so um yeah uh i mean we talked about uh the gears of war ultimate edition and um we're gonna play that when I, we're gonna play that when i come visit right the gears of war we should play it together yeah i think absolutely yeah all right so it's actually interesting because now you have all these great Xbox One exclusives that came out um, in the second half of 2015, like Gears of War Ultimate, like Rare Replay, like Tomb Raider. Uh, and you you can just buy all the Xbox One's best exclusives for a pretty cheap price now. I have seen Gears of War Ultimate for $10. I've seen... The Master Chief Collection for ten dollars. I've seen me? Rare Replay for ten dollars. I've seen all of these on sale for ten dollars. I mean, for for limited times. But, but still, n but you still. never see a Nintendo game on sale for ten dollars. I mean, the closest we get is Nintendo Selects, and that's like twenty bucks for like Ocarina of Time 3D or Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. Granted, that's a great program. Yeah, but i mean that this is like four years later these are basically brand new games rare replay came out last year you get it for 10 bucks it's crazy it's unbelievable so yeah if you want an xbox one uh actually wait no don't get it it's i know it's 300 dollars. <laughs> i know it has ga the games coming out for cheap now but man that system just I just look at the thing and it makes me angry. It does. Every it day. does feel a little bit like Microsoft is getting away from consoles, doesn't it? I mean, they're still pushing games like Quantum Break, and you know, I'm sure they're going to have a big show at E3 again this year. But the more I look at it, it just kind of looks like Sony's outselling Microsoft like two to one on these consoles. Microsoft is quickly becoming completely non-competitive in an industry that thrives on competition. Uh, so much so that they're resorting to things like, oh, we're going to have uh, cross-platform multiplayer which is never going to happen properly by the way because sony would never agree to do that if it was going to yeah. help microsoft at all um i mean and they're not in a position like nintendo where they have this incredible install base of fans that love their franchises because what microsoft franchise is like really beloved to the average gamer's heart they don't have a mario or a pokemon they have halo but halo is kind of fallen by the wayside and gears of war hasn't been seen in five years uh and i i don't think people are really clamoring for gears of war 4 since the the, the development team was purchased and bought out by Microsoft. So um, it just, exactly. back to my original point, it just kind of feels like Microsoft is getting away from hardcore gaming on, on consoles, at least. Uh, there's this big push for them to bring everything to PC and this Windows 10 Microsoft platform, which is just going to be awful for the PC gaming industry. And I really hope they don't develop any kind of monopoly on that. Um, so, um, I have to ask we're, you. We're going way off what we were originally supposed I, to talk about. I know, here. but this this is what our show is all about. This is this is a playground talk right here. I have to ask you, how much do you think Microsoft is regretting letting Bungie go right now? Because oh, as much of a grind fest as uh, Destiny is, and imagine if that had been Xbox One exclusive that early in that console's life. Uh, life cycle that would have been huge if they had got exactly. destiny that game came out in september of 2014 and it was just 
It was everywhere. Like IGN had a freaking podcast for it, like that game specifically. And it's like they couldn't secure that because they no longer owned Bungie. What a big mistake that was. So, yeah, now uh, Microsoft is, since they don't have Bungie anymore and they have, uh, I would, some people would say are B teams working on uh, their big franchises now. Bad teams. And now, now you have them sort of pushing this United Windows platform, which is sort of combining the Xbox One with uh, Windows 10, I believe we're on right now. As if the interface for Windows 10 and Xbox One weren't confusing enough by themselves. Now they're going to combine them. And uh, Windows 10 and that, that United Windows platform, it is receiving a lot of flack, in fact because it doesn't help that windows 10 is a freaking abortion of a software developers are sort of speaking out against it and um say, saying that what microsoft is doing is they are creating a closed system and ruining sort of what made what makes windows such a great platform and operating system is that it's so open for developers to utilize um and so yeah there's there's this fear that as, as it becomes a more closed platform, that the experience is going to be far, far less enjoyable and more, um, I, it's just going to sh put shackles on the players. And it puts things like Steam in jeopardy, right? I, I don't really, I haven't really looked into yes. this too much. It does put Steam in jeopardy, and that that is another issue. Is a lot of people don't want to move away from Steam. Steam is sort, Steam is sort of like a console in itself steam is a phenomenal gaming platform that i didn't even really get into until like last year and now i'm all over it i'm all about steam i don't even play pc games i just love the i love the platform i love how easy it is to find games on there and like look at reviews and just like see everybody and you can return games if you don't like them and it's just like this is crazy crazy good experience yes and i mean other than the customer service which has received a lot of flack um I think people just not sort of turning windows into a closed platform is just a really, really bad kind of idea. I think that having a windows store is fine, but um, the direction it's going is in is not good for consumers. Um, and ultimately isn't that, is a good thing. Yes. Ultimately being best for the consumer is what this is all about. So, uh, you know, uh, I I don't want to see I don't want to see Microsoft get out of console gaming and then take over PC gaming and be like this is our domain now. Everybody else get off my jungle gym. You know what I mean? Uh, I I do not want to see that. I think that's very bad for the industry, especially when a company as incompetent and as money hungry as Microsoft gets into that realm. I, I'm very concerned about what's going to happen in the realm of PC gaming. Uh, so that that's my view on it. Yeah, I I don't have much else to say about the subject. Um, so you that you started, you know, if, if yeah. Nintendo controlled everything, uh, if Nintendo made a great platform again, and then you could buy all your multi-platform games on your Nintendo console and your Nintendo games on your Nintendo console. I mean, well, I guess it's a bad thing because it's a monopoly. But I'd be happy for a little while because I would only have to own one system. Well, they'd be okay with it because they just make you buy Super Mario Brothers fifteen different times, and then you know you'd have. You'd have that whole setup going on. Um, but you started the show saying that you had a dream. And apart from immediately thinking you were about to make some like all-time great speech, uh, I, I thought about a dream that I myself had, in fact, just last night. Um, and I wanted to talk about it because I thought it was great. And I teased it on Twitter this morning, at SpiegelWee. Um, I had a dream about Nintendo announcing the NX. And they didn't announce it. They actually showed it to me. Uh, I was the only one who knew about it in the whole world, except for Nintendo people, because they were showing it to me privately, like in my house. This was my dream, of course. Uh, so let me let me tell you about this new system, everybody. This is the new system that Nintendo is coming out with. First of all, <clears throat> it is a it's a handheld and a console, as most people have been predicting. Uh, the handheld part of it, right? It looks a lot like a 2DS. But it has the it's got two screens and everything. It looks like it's kind of got that tablet thing, but it's more it it's kind of shaped like a tablet, 
it, like a rectangle kind of, and it's got the thumbsticks from the Wii U gamepad. Uh, it's got two of them, one on each side, but it has all the same buttons otherwise that the that the uh, 2DS has. Um, it's backwards compatible with DS and 3DS games. Uh, it uh, takes cartridges, um, and it is called the oh shoot I forgot the name of uh, the Nintendo Auto DN2. And I have no idea what any of this stuff means, but I was like trying to come up with what it could possibly mean in my mind this morning after I woke up. What do you think of that name? Huh. The Nintendo Auto DN2. That's a terrible name. I know, right? But I think That's, the, that sounds like a uh, code name more than anything. The and only and even it has a code name that's bad. The only thing I could think of was that DN maybe stood for like dual Nintendo or something. And the two was like, oh, it has two screens. But then I was like, well, what's the point of the dual then? So maybe it stands for something else. And I thought auto maybe meant that it was like one of those auto powered devices, kind of like an iPhone, how it's like always on, but it just, it's powers down if you're not playing it. I was mm -hmm. thinking maybe it could have a feature like that. That'd be kind of cool uh, for it to be a little more like a phone and have some of those more advanced, uh, like the Vita does it too with its, um, like it powers down if you don't play it after a while, but you can still turn it back on and it's right there. Uh, yeah, and then the other part of the dream, which was my favorite part, was that when they revealed the console to me, and the guy—I have no idea who it was—some Japanese guy in a suit. He came out and he was holding this white, like egg thing, and it was just pure white. It looked like the original Wii level of white. And on the back, there was like an HDMI port, and there was a an, an AC adapter port, and there was also a port for uh, the sensor bar, uh, as well as a wireless like dongle port where you could plug in your 2dn or your your dn auto dn2 and play games like on that it wasn't really clear it's a freaking dream people i don't know but the the top of the egg would like open up and you could put a disc in there um and all the controllers were wireless and i didn't get to see what the controllers looked like because they were just using a, a wii u gamepad to play super smash brothers the console was backwards compatible with wii u games so it was really disappointing as far as dreams go. Uh, oh, but the best part of the console was that they told me this is the, called the Nintendo success because our last console was such a failure. <laughs> and I just thought that was so funny. Like I, I laughed in my dream because I thought it was funny and I wanted to sh I wanted to share that all that stuff with you. That is a perfect name for it. I wanted to share all of that stuff with you guys because I just thought it was such a great dream. And you guys should all dream about your favorite company revealing things only to you because it, it makes you in a, it puts you in a good mood for the rest of the day. What what really uh, just I love about that dream is that the Nintendo success is in the shape of an egg. I mean, that, that, how that, that's such how a Nintendo cliche thing to do, isn't like nin or how how cliche of an internet kind of view of what next gen console should look like. It should be it should be round and snazzy and like it looked like an egg, but it, it had a it had a base right so you could like stand it up it wouldn't just like roll all over the room uh but uh it, it, yeah I, I was really pleased and if they choose to go in a, an egg shaped direction i would i would get on board with that i think i feel like uh if that were the case then the code name for the system would be called the nintendo windfish <laughs> oh man oh link's awakening is such a good game you should all go play it uh, yeah, it really is. Yeah, so so that's my dream. Thank you all for listening. Uh, it, Nintendo. Um, yeah, speaking of Nintendo, supposedly they're going to be revealing the NX before E3. This comes from a source of a NeoGaf user, the same NeoGaf user who, like, he kind of leaked Pokemon Black and White several years ago before those games came out. It's the same guy, and he says that they'll be revealing it before E3. Uh, do you believe that? Yes. I have a hard and time. And you know why? Why do you believe it? They haven't announced they're going to be doing anything like Space World or anything this year, so they don't really have a platform for revealing this thing and making it this big, huge event. Nintendo because Directs because of are, all the other leaks. But Nintendo Directs are fine, but they're not like big events that everybody in the whole world stops what they're doing and checks it out. They usually can just go find a roundup later. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just sort of the way that companies are doing things now. Everything's about their own their own events and controlling the flow of information to um, 
fans themselves. I mean, every company does this now. I mean, it makes they, they don't like to go through news source news outlets because news outlets have their own bias, or well, I guess they're a little bit more more unbiased than the co- actual companies that are right. They want to sell control. Their the, they want to control the statement that they're making with their reveal, which I understand. Yeah. But again, I, I feel like E3 is such a perfect place to unveil something like that. That or the Game Developers Conference, but they, we didn't hear anything about it then either. Uh, Nintendo will never reveal anything through that kind of setting again. That's not true. The first time they showed the Wii Remote was at E3, and it was like E3 2004. And yeah, that was 12 years ago. Yeah, but you just said they would never do it. They've already done it. No, I'm saying they will never do it again. Why not? Because... That it takes the control of that flow of information out of their hands. I've I mean, been I've been saying for years that I that Nintendo should go back to doing a stage show because we're never going to get that Twilight Princess reaction again if they don't do it. The internet is fine, but it's it's diluted because there's a lot of voices as opposed to just watching a video stream of like 300 people just screaming their lungs out over this this video of a photorealistic Link riding a horse. You know, we're not. That gonna, was quite the announcement. It was one of the most epic moments in, in video game history, I think. I, I mean, if you're going to start tallying those up, uh, what, are, what are some of the best ones? Too bad they ended up delaying it and, yeah, releasing well, you know, the last generation. But, but Miyamoto coming game. out on stage and the music. You know, it, the another good one is, uh, I just thought of this, is when Sony announced that their system was only going to be $400, like immediately after Microsoft's press conference, and they said it was going to be 500 yeah. I think Sony maybe hadn't even decided on a price until Microsoft said their price. And then they're like, oh, sweet, we can tailor the whole presentation around this announcement that it's only going to be 400 bucks. Um, anyway, uh, so, uh, yeah, what were we talking about? Something? E3? Nintendo. Yeah, Nintendo and E3. Um, Nintendo and, really, and showing off uh, the NX before E3. So I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, I would like we it to. We know it's coming. I would like I mean, NX we, News we tomorrow. Know. It's not going to be tomorrow, but give I mean, me, give just me like something. in the next three months, we will likely know what the NX exactly is. My thought process is this. Nintendo's next big game, apart from their Miitomo smartphone app, is going to be Star Fox, right? That comes out in like late April-ish. So yep. it, then they have nothing between that and basically the end of E3 and there's like a JRPG coming out. Tokyo Mirage Sessions hashtag Fire Emblem, and so that comes out at the end of June, right? So, so I'm I'm so, gonna guess uh, late May they're gonna have a Nintendo Direct. Oh, I don't want to wait that long, and then then they're gonna be like, oh, we'll show you more at E3. So make sure yep. to tune in. That's terrible. I don't want to see that. I want news now. I don't want to wait for it. I'm I'm done with waiting. We haven't had a legitimate piece of Nintendo news in forever. Yeah, the last direct was sort of disappointing, wasn't it? Dragon Quest Seven looks really good. I pre um, I pre-ordered it the other day. I was really I'm really excited about it. Would you like to discuss this uh, Nikkei report? So this Nikkei report, I don't I have no idea if we're pronouncing it right or not. Uh, this came out today. We're recording on the twenty second of March, and go ahead and uh, read this report. Do you have it in front of you? I don't have it in front. Okay, of Okay, I've got it here. This is from uh, this is from Seth Macy on IGN. He's just a middleman. He's just uh, reporting some news that already came out. But he says, according to a Japanese report, Nintendo is ending production on the Wii U at the end of 2016. That's it. Like at the at the end of the year, we're not getting any more Wii U's. So immediately, I started thinking, well, what does this mean? Does this mean that Nintendo has? I mean, obviously, they've officially given up on the Wii U if they're ending production on it. Yeah. Well. But does I mean, that mean the I asked is you to do a little year? sleuthing. I, feel I, like, I yes. I asked you to look into when uh, other systems went out of production, and generally they went out of production after the new console came out. Correct. That is correct. And one of the most interesting things that I found actually was that the uh, the Wii ceased production in 2013, but is actually still in production in Europe. So this thing, the Wii, might outlast the Wii U, which I find incredibly not humorous uh kind of depressing Sad. actually uh, yeah because uh, the wii U is a uh, far better console but and the other thing i found was that the xbox 360 and playstation 3s are both still in production at least until the end of this year which is just crazy to me 
but the other data I found was that uh, the Xbox was in production until like late 2006, and then the GameCube was in production until like the middle of 2007. Uh, so, um, I mean, th th I feel like that that tells a story, right? That the NX is coming out this year. That's what it feels like, and I mean, we've we've been saying it all year, like, oh yeah, this thing's coming out this year. This thing's co definitely coming out this year. At least the quote unquote handheld part of it. Uh, which we still don't even know if that's a thing, but that that's generally the consensus around the industry, right? I think it is. I it has to come out this year. I'm so excited. This thing's gonna be amazing. It's gonna no. It, you know what it's gonna be? It's gonna be the worst. The 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 system's just gonna be. It's gonna be called the Wii U two or something stupid, and it's just gonna flop and just flounder and die. And There's no way. I think the end Nintendo, Nintendo. realized just how big of a mistake calling it the Wii U was. I At least I hope they do. Oh, they have to know now. Kimishima's not an idiot, right? He's well, got a they, smart they business They made the sense. same mistake twice in a row. I mean, they did it with the 3DS, and then they did it again with the Wii U. I think the difference, the, any, the difference with the 3DS was, at the time, DS and Wii brand power were huge in 2010. I don't blame them for calling it the 3DS. It, they're building off brand power. I think, And I think, ultimately, it ended up working in the 3DS's favor. 3DS has been a fairly successful system. Uh, it was not when it first came out. And I will tell you right now that most people thought the 3DS was merely a DS that did 3D. They thought it was the exact same thing. It only displayed games in 3D, which, as we both know, is not the case. Correct? I mean, yeah, the, the games don't look good when you use 3D. So Yeah, and... <laughs> Don't forget the 3DS That's a joke. bombed hard at the at launch. It, yeah. it released at two hundred fifty dollars, and nobody bought it. It had Just Steel nobody. Diver and Ocarina of Time 3D, and like that was it for yeah. months and months. And then Mario Kart, I think, came out that year, uh, the, like late that year. And I think Mario 3D World came out the same year as well. And then the next year they had Pokemon and Luigi's Mansion and Fire Emblem Awakening and a whole crap ton of awesome games. And that the 2013 I think was when the system really took off with all those. Um, am, I, am I did I get the timeline correct? That's all correct, right? Um, I I have no idea. Okay, well anyway, uh, but the 3DS ended up being successful. Wii U obviously was not. I don't think they'll make the mistake of naming their console something stupid and unrecognizable, like out of the yeah. gate. I actually wonder sort of what the NX stands for, since all their code names. Well, it's the uh, Nintendo Auto like... DN2 is what it is. That's what it's going to be called. No, 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 no. God, um, I love the name of the console, the Nintendo Success. That would be just so great. No. Yes. No. Call it the Nintendo Success. What a horrible idea. <laughs> no, it's great. But but instead of success, like put an X in there. Like success. Sess. Oh, S U X C E. This just gets worse every passing moment. Let's move on. Uh, no, I want to talk about this for 45 more minutes. So, any other rumors you want to talk about? Not really. Um, I did think that we could introduce a new feature, as if we don't have enough of those on this show. We already have like the broken, incomplete games of 2016. Nah. We have the bucket list. We have 52 games in 52 weeks, which, by the way, uh, even though we haven't done a show in a while, I think we're doing pretty well. You're doing pretty well, right? No. Well, how many no. games? This is week 12. How many games have you beaten? Um, I count 11. So that's not bad. Although you were yeah, way ahead to start the year. Most of those games were re actually nearly every game I have played so far this year has been a replay. And I mean, we'll get to that. Stop. Soon, no, but. that's not true at all. It is. No, it's it not. It is very true. Well, anyway, uh, and then I beat 11 of them, so I'm not that far behind, and I'm, I'm working on Twilight Princess HD. Do you want to talk about Twilight Princess HD real quick? Because we're both, we're both playing it, or you played it. I'm still playing it. Well, yeah. I mean, if you want to talk about it now, or yeah, let's should talk, we just move into 52? Let's talk about it. Let's do it. Well, hold on. Real quick, let's talk about that, and uh, we'll come back to the rumor thing, because I, I want to introduce this new feature, but let's, let's get this Twilight Princess stuff out of the way, because I want to talk about it. Um, okay, well, yeah, Twilight Princess HD came out. I got it. Um, I for think... those of you who don't know, I was a huge, 
huge hater of the wind waker just couldn't stand it when it came out and twilight princess for that matter and um when twilight princess was announced and yeah you know everybody freaked out about it i was watching it and i was like so what the wind waker was bad it was just not a hold on you watched you watched that press conference in 2004 live and you saw those people just flipping their s about this like huge new yep. direction no way i don't buy it i don't buy that for a second you were excited Dead serious and you know I, it the the i i was only worried you are a about what the gameplay liar. would be I am dead serious. Dead serious. I'm gonna, I was I, not. I'm going to do a little work. I know it's effortless. I'm going to download that video of that reaction. I'm going to put it in right here, and you're going to be able to watch it. And you tell me that you think Piddle wasn't excited. But before you leave, I'd like you to step inside one more world for Nintendo Game Cube. I wasn't. I, I mean, I was happy a new Zelda game was coming out, but I was very cautiously optimistic about it because, like I said, I did not like the gameplay of the Wind Waker. And all I saw when they did that Twilight Princess reveal was, well, they listened to everybody about the graphics, but the graphics don't make the game. And uh, I... I really enjoyed the Wind Waker HD. I mean, it's in my top 50 now. The changes they made to that game made it a lot better. It made it just flat out made it a better game by a long shot. Um, and so with Twilight Princess, yeah, that came out and it was on the Wii. I did not like Twilight Princess on the Wii. I, in fact, it is the only Zelda game that I have ever sold. The only one I have ever sold. Um, how much did you get for it? I think I got like 50 bucks for it. Oh, nice. That's good. The yeah, game was it, 50 bucks when it came out. So it, it, it was a pretty good amount of money. It might not have been 50. It might have been a little bit less, but I know I got quite a lot of money back on it and I was completely fine with it because I had tried to replay it several times and I was never able to get past, um, I think the third tiers of light section of the game because Oh, I don't blame you. Because the Twilight parts of uh, Twilight Princess are horrible. They're not they fun. Are... They are not fun. And and you know what? And I don't know what it is about it. I mean, like, I, I try to look at it, and I try to think, like, well, you're searching for these... Um, bugs. These bugs. That are hidden. And they're hidden. And In like, wolf you, form, you have which to, is not fun. You have to figure out how to find them. So I'm just like, what what, what makes it so unrewarding to search out these bugs and find them when like there are so many other parts of Zelda games where it's about finding something that's rewarding why is it that the bugs are unrewarding and it might just be because there's so many of them um 16 for each area in the original that means 48 bugs you're collecting 48 bugs over like the span of like three four hours of gameplay 
it's uh it, it is such a grind and it's like oh when is this gonna be over and the worst part is like all the cutscenes where you have to like look at the people who became spirits and they're like oh what's happening oh oh the bug died how did that happen yeah like over and over again it's just like oh but i think that that might have been an issue is just you didn't feel like this twilight realm and oh everybody's like a just like a spirit and there didn't shadow feel like there was a sense of danger of right bugs. it's just like why are why are they scared of these bugs like what's the big deal there was no and, sense that anything really dangerous was going on and it's yeah. because they didn't build up a villain until the twilight had already been dispelled and then we first learned about xant it's like really so that's what we've been working to stop this whole time it just seemed like kind of a mysterious area like generic area to me until that and then by the time you found out there was something sinister going on you never went back into the twilight again so that was it yeah um and but, that was just one part but, of it that was but, just one part of the weaver i didn't like the like add on the waggle controls which i mean when the game first came out it was like oh this is so new and interesting and exciting let's talk but, about the let's talk about the good parts of twilight princess hd right so they whoa, fixed hold on i'm almost done well, uh, there, there's a lot to complain about there's a lot okay. to get through La last part is just i i don't like anything about the twilight realm period i don't like the, the the design of the enemies um that it doesn't really feel like anything bad is happening um you can't hum the music to yourself the music is just because it it's like on your ears it's horrible like every single time you had to fight the twi twilight creature <laughs> it's like they threw an mp3 into a blender and if for whatever reason you screwed up and didn't kill all of them at once they'd all come back oh yeah so so everything about the twilight realm i just did not like and that's why i could never get past um that last tears of light section whenever i replayed it. I, I tried to replay it like four or five times after i first beat it so let's talk about Twilight Princess HD and what it did yes. to improve the experience. So the first thing you mentioned, right, was the Twilight Realm and the bug collecting. And they already streamlined it a little bit, a little bit in a little. HD. And it was better. It was a better experience. Getting only 12 bugs, I feel like, was a way more uh, acceptable number, right? Because by eliminating four, you effectively eliminate 12 of them. So you're now honestly getting... they should have eliminated 12 of them and just kept it four well for each area but i, I kind of liked especially the second tears of light uh, realm where you kind of go into kakariko village and you have to like burn down that house and you know you have to go exploring around the village i like that and i like that they kept they kept kind of the most important ones they didn't make you go out of your way to like the graveyard to go get one or whatever uh you just kind of you kind of went through the area and you got the most important bugs from the most important areas and I felt yeah. like they streamlined the process, but the fact that you don't have to wait for the stupid tier of light to like drop to the ground before you can collect it is just, it's amazing how much it improves the experience, which doesn't really even make any sense, but it did improve it. It's it like did. what, half a second more you have to wait, but it, it's, it it's, was way longer than that. Maybe. I swear it was like 10 seconds. You were waiting for that long. stupid thing to fall down. And that's, tw that's 16 times. So just, you can do the math on that. Two and a half minutes of your life gone. Yeah, and, and I don't know about you. That's but such like, a funny, trivial thing to complain about, but you, it's real, right? It's a real complaint. Yeah, it is very real. Like, you would try to kill the bugs close to, like, a ledge that you could climb up on so that you could, like, go up the ledge and then get it quicker. It, it was just, yeah, I don't know what they were thinking. Like I said, everything about the Twilight experience is really, really unrewarding and not, not fun. Well, and you've said this regarding, you know, you said you don't know what you were thinking. I think you do know what they were thinking. They were trying to make the game a more theatrical experience. You they were trying to make it say, longer. You say yourself, yeah, by extending it two minutes, that's really what they were doing. But uh, well, no, hold on, like, let me finish. About let me finish. It. You you were saying yourself the reason you didn't like Twilight Princess originally is because the game takes so much control away from you early on that it feels like you're not playing a game. It is so clear to me they were trying to make this a cinematic Zelda experience compared to the other adventure games that were dominating at the time shadow of the colossus okami was a really big long like epic adventure game they were trying to make it more like that and i think they succeeded except that it's not as much fun to play when you're just watching it and the game's constantly taking control away from you like you say well one of the big narratives in the gaming press at the time was 
like all the journalists were clamoring for bigger, longer adventures. All you kids don't remember this. Yeah, go look back at just um, any of the articles and like interviews about these games. And they're constantly asking developers, and it's not just for Twilight Princess, it's for everything. They're asking, like, how long is this game going to be? Is this going to be a big game? And you have the Twilight Princess developers going, oh, it, this is like a 50-hour game. It's like our biggest Zelda yet. And, I mean, yeah, it, it took a long time to beat this game because it had all of this, all of these moments where it took control away from the player. Um, it padded Lots things of out with these Tears of Light section. I mean, oh, man. That last Tears of Light section, the third one, is... Through the Lanaru province. It, it's unbearable. It, it, it is it's, terrible. Yeah, it's you just really have to bad. traverse the entire province. Oh, and the part where you have to fly up the river with a stupid bird, and you have to do it, like, multiple times. It's the freaking living end of boredom. It's awful. And, the, and yeah. you know what? The worst part bad of all controls. is the freaking Wii controls, where they're just like, oh, just, just point anywhere, and it'll kind of do what you want sometimes, maybe. Uh, I don't yep. want to get too much into complaining about the Wii version of the game, but there's a lot of flaws in that game that have not aged well at all. Yeah, and it's, point, and it's, using and, the pointer for that section was just ugh, cringe. But back to the HD version, they did fix a lot of that stuff. Unfortunately, that bird thing is still in there. Uh, but the, it's it's a more streamlined game. The, you can actually play it now, and your eyes don't feel like they want to explode just by looking at the screen. It looks really good. Unfortunately, the character models still look like crap, but uh, the it looks really good. The textures and are phenomenal. There were moments where I was just like that. I felt like the game looked like um, more like an Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3 game. Um, I mean, generally it didn't just because it doesn't have a very complex lighting system, and that was one of the things I was really hoping they would do with the game. Uh, going back and playing it, though, I sort of I sort of noticed some areas that would have made a dynamic lighting system not work so well, especially with the way that the twilight works with like the way that Midna is Link's shadow, the way that works. I don't know how they could have done that with the dynamic kind of lighting system. It's kind of clear that they like they, they, they didn't really put as much effort into redoing this game as they did with wind waker. They really overhauled the entire wind waker you know, dynamic. They overhauled the character models. They overhauled the lighting. They changed everything in that game. This game did not feel like they put as much into it. I'm not sure why um, that would be. Except they still did. I mean, in terms of redoing most of the textures in the game, they still did quite a bit of work. No, the textures are amazing. Like I said, yeah. But I, but they did the character models with Wind Waker. I don't see why they couldn't do them again with this game, unless they just ran out of time and they're like, "Holy crap, we need something for the first half of the year." Did they redo the Wind Waker models? Uh, they definitely redid Link. I mean, he looks a lot different if you look at him. But anyway, I I, I digress. They might have redone him, but I don't think they redid a lot of the other um, characters well, in the well, game. It wasn't important as much because they held up over time with the cartoon style. This realistic style, as mm -hmm. I've said many times, does not hold up 10 years later. And it's why I wish developers would go for a more stylistic. It's why I was so excited to see Zelda on Wii U back when they revealed that in 2014, I was so excited to see that it wasn't like photorealistic and it was more following the skyward sword trend, which yep. although I didn't care for the character models in that game, that was more because of the style choice, not because it doesn't hold up today. Um, I'll actually, you know, you can tell we're Zelda fans cause we have, we are talking about Twilight princess HD quite a bit. Yeah. We, I, I'm not going to lie. We love Zelda. Big, big, fans. Uh, I will say playing Twilight princess HD. I, I had really sort of written off um, the original Wii version of the game. It was actually the pretty much at the bottom of my list, only above uh, the DS games. And after replaying it and sort of forcing myself to just get through the bad parts of the game, which after I did that, after I got past the last uh, Twilight section, I immediately saved the game or saved a second file so I'd never have to play the beginning of the game. <laughs> that was brilliant, to. by the way. I love that you did that. I'm thinking about doing the same thing. And uh, just everything after that part of the game, I fell in love with, whether it's the Lantern Caves, whatever else. And um, I, like, to my surprise, I ended up 100%ing the game. Nice. And I, I don't usually 100% games. So, yeah, that just... 
really, really surprised so me. So what, what's um, your score for the game then? Uh, I'm curious to see because I'm not sure if mine is going to change. I originally gave Twilight Princess a 4 out of 5. Uh, it might be creeping to a 5. It's really close. Um, The last part, like once you get past that last section, it's a 5 out of 5 game easily. I, like, I just have 100% I've... 5 out of 5 Zelda game. But because of that first part of the game, and I know that they streamlined it a little bit, and there's only 12 bugs to find now. Um, I just, it still brings the game, the whole overall experience down. So I have to give it a four and makes me feel bad. But like, I feel like I'm we, also, we kind of have a hard time as Zelda fans separating this game from other Zelda games and comparing it to superior games like Ocarina of Time, like Wind Waker, because in I know Twilight Princess is a superior gaming experience. Like, there's no doubt in my mind that it is, but I just can't help. The second half. I can't help but want to give it a four out of five just because it's not as good as those other Zelda games. And I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to compare it. I don't want to compare it that way. But it's sort of the way my mind works. Uh, I'm, I'm a very big proponent of uh, pacing in games. I feel like if games don't have good pacing um, within, like, the first few hours, then it should be held against them because it's the first like few hours of the game that are supposed to get you hooked um, and wanting to play more. So if you're getting bogged down with hours and hours of tutorials and slow text and cutscenes, um, then, then yeah, like it should be held against the game. And so, I mean, even as just a game, I think it holds Twilight Princess back. And um, normally I probably, before I probably would have given it a three out of five, um, so I think me giving a four out of five is it, well, generous enough. All right. Um, yeah, let's move on. We, we spent a lot of time on that, right? That was fun though. I like that. Yeah. Twilight princess HD. Great game. I have the only thing I haven't done is the cave of shadows and I have like eight stamps that I could collect if I wanted to. I don't think it counts as a hundred percent. If you don't get the stamps, I think you got to go get the stamps, get back in Ugh. there. Um, so anyway, I want to get back to this E3 rumor mill that I that I came up with, this idea. Every week leading up to E3, since we're getting kind of in that realm, getting into the E3 mood, a new news cycle is beginning. I'm kind of getting excited, getting ramped up. Uh, I thought maybe every week we could go over some of the latest rumors and just kind of talk about it a little bit. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know if this is an E3 rumor, uh, but I'll throw it out yeah, there. Yeah, go ahead. Go, go with your first one. Uh there are talks that both Microsoft and Sony are thinking about having a Xbox like 1.5 or a PlayStation 4.5. That's interesting. Sort of a stopgap console release. Sort of like the new Nintendo 3DS. You know what that makes me think? It makes me think that they know something about Nintendo's plans for this year that, that we don't know. Because – I mean, it, Maybe this is the stupid thing to say, but like, say hypothetically, Sony and Microsoft know that Nintendo is going to come out with this console that has industry leading chips, which is a quote that we brought up a couple months ago. And, you know, it has all these interesting, like, forward looking technologies. And they're getting worried that they're not going to be able to attract top level talent to develop for their system, which is stupid. And there's no well, way, that there's no way they think that, right? Because Sony, the PlayStation 4 has 40 million units out in the world already. But well, think about it. Let's let's suppose that you have these, um, you have Microsoft and Sony, and they're talking to AAA game publishers, and the publishers are saying, "Well, we're not going to be using your system as the lead platform." And I mean, naturally, they think, like, "Wait, what? Why would you not be using our system as the lead platform?" Well, your system's not powerful enough, and I mean, especially if Sony's getting to that point, they're like, well, whose system is the most powerful? That's what I could see as a possibility of happening. The only reason I don't see that happening because is because I just don't see Nintendo having that same install base. They don't have the install base right now. Why would Sony be worried right now? If they're going to be worried, be worried next year if NX sells 5 million out of the gate and then does 10 million early next year. Then you can start to get worried. If Nintendo has sold 15 million units of whatever the hell the NX is by the middle of next year, then if you're Sony and you've only got 50 million PS4s out there, Nintendo has sold 15 million in, what, six months? 
then you can worry. Then you can be yeah, like, okay, we're going to do a redesign. In business, you never want to be reactive. You want to be proactive. That so. is true, except in this situation where Sony is in such a position of dominance, I don't, yeah, they I really don't are. see the necessity at this moment. I think they should wait and see what the NX is. And once it, this is, of course, assuming they don't know, which it's reasonable to assume that they don't. Companies that are competing always hide secrets from each other. If they don't know what the NX is and they're just believing these rumors that it's going to be powerful, just wait. Don't prepare a whole E3 presentation about how the PS4K or whatever it's called is going to be this amazing new platform that's going to output in 4K and 720p and like it's going to have a bunch of crappy, glitchy games like The Division. And, you know, I got way off topic there because I started thinking about something else. Uh, <laughs> But so anyway, Sony is so dominant. I don't see why they need to do that right now. I think they can wait. Yes, they can. Microsoft, I think it should get out of consoles because it's not working. So yeah. And has it ever really worked for them? Well, the Xbox 360 was completely dominant for like three years. Yeah, it was, it was dominant, but the thing was just an absolute mess. <laughs> it was a dumpster fire by the end. Yeah. But and uh, the big reason that it was successful is because it was the lead platform and cheaper and came out a year early good point so yeah they had a lot going for it and so in that sense if nintendo is developing this nx to be this industry leading thing it would be awesome if they went for the whole this is an industry leader oh by the way it's the same price as ps4 and xbox one out of the gate and it's more powerful and you get nintendo games it's it, it seems like such a simple formula for success that it's like why don't they just do it uh, so there's got to be something we don't know as as just uh, as consumers, but uh, I don't know. We can only hope. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple other rumors I wanted to touch on. Uh, one is that Rockstar is probably going to be showing off Red Dead Redemption Two at some point. Uh, so it only matter. It, the only thing that really matters because we all knew this was coming. It's it's like how we all knew Fallout Four was going to get announced last year. Um, the only thing that really matters, which console developer is going to get Red Dead Redemption 2 shown off at their event? Is it going to be Sony or is it going to be Microsoft? And, and if, if one of those companies can nab exclusivity rights for that game, that would be pretty huge, I would think. Especially it will if it's, be especially massive. Especially if it's Sony. If Sony can get Red Dead Redemption 2 exclusive, that, that's, that's the nail in the coffin, right? That's the Timed exclusive? Possibly. I mean, Tomb Raider did nothing for Microsoft. It did not move the needle at all. Uh, is that because it's a timed exclusive? I don't. I don't know if timed exclusives are really relevant anymore. It was because it came out the same day as Fallout Four. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, what a, <laughs> what a blunder that was. Um, and then the other rumor was uh, that uh, Deep Silver, developer of Dead Island and Saints Row, and one other game that I can't remember right now. Uh, they're going to be showing a new big project at this year's E3. And in fact, they have, quote, several games in the works. Um, and one of those games is rumored to be Saints Row 5. And the other one is rumored to be, surprise, surprise, an HD, or not an HD remaster, but an, uh, a remastered collection of Saints Row 1 through 4. A game that failed so miserably at being Grand Theft Auto that it eventually just went completely off the wall and did like some crazy stupid crap with aliens that didn't make any sense. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, I'm not a fan of Saints Row. I, I think it's terrible. I really don't like Saints Row at all. I just, I don't know. They sort of tried to do their own thing with that type of genre. They they started off being like, we're going to kill Grand Theft Auto with this. And they didn't even do great. They didn't even do it better than Grand Theft Auto 4, which didn't do a great job. I mean, come on. I, I, THQ is not the is not the developer with the world's greatest track record. I mean, they're bankrupt now, but I I don't know. I, I think people were expecting too much out of them when that first Saints Row game came out, and then it was disappointing to a lot of people, including myself. So I guess I can include myself under that umbrella. So that's it for my rumors. That's it for this week. Nothing else. Yeah. Do you want to Do you want to finish the show on that? I mean, this this next no. topic that we have is going to be kind of long we're already 50 plus minutes into this i i'm looking at it and i'm just thinking oh man do we really want to get into this it's do quite a really rabbit it's quite a rabbit hole to go down if we're going to start discussing ubisoft yeah yeah um nah we we complain about that stuff enough okay i think uh well, let's just we'll move on to the last one which 
I feel like we should discuss. Let's just say this. The Division came out after we did our most recent show. It came out like a couple days after it. And uh, it was generally got a decent reception, right? But it mostly just ended up being another Very one Very mixed. It mostly ended up being one of those like Ubisoft marketing campaigns that like everyone's like, oh, this is going to win game of the year. And it just kind of ended up being more like this game is good. It didn't live up to the expectation and the hype as usual, just like Watch yeah. Dogs, just like all those other Ubisoft funded games. Um, There's a lot of I mean, it's essentially a more modern, realistic take on the Destiny type of gameplay. And uh, there's just people are sort of ripping it because it, it's trying to go for that MMO feel has a complete lack of options in terms of like character customization. Well, and there's a season um, pass. That's like $40. It's like, yeah, God, one of these people, ah, I just so tired of it. I'm you got yet another season pass kind of game. Um, it's a game. You can't play it by yourself. You have to play with other people uh, in order for it to be enjoyable at all. And you I know mean, me, I'm immediately out when I hear that. I so. mean, for like an MMO type of, MMO light kind of experience. You need to have a very good social um, structure in place, I feel like. And yeah, so a lot of the reviews are very mixed. They're like, well, it does this better than how Destiny did it, but it does this thing that Destiny did poorly, poorly too. And it does this thing that Destiny did really well, horribly. So. It's just, yeah, it's a game that people will probably play, like, hop on and play daily with their I'll, friends. I'll tell you what. I work at a video game store, right? It's no secret. I work at a video game retailer. And, you know, people will people sell us their games when they're done playing them. I've got about 50 copies of Destiny in the drawer. I've got about 100 copies of Star Wars Battlefront already. And I, I'll tell you what. I'm going to about 100 of The Division in a couple months. So come on by. Get it for get <laughs> has it, for it 50, started yet? Get it for fifteen bucks. No, not yet. Game's still too new, uh, but it'll happen soon. It usually usually takes about a month or two. Star Wars Battlefront. I had I had uh, I had pre-owned copies in my drawer probably a couple days after it came out. But but uh, Division, I imagine, is only a matter of time. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I want. Only wanted matter to say. of time. Um. So yeah, just typical just, Ubisoft. Just, just be careful, okay? When you see a game that's marketed like the division is marketed when you see commercials that's like this is the greatest game ever made go don't rogue. don't even buy it <laughs> don't buy it uh because it's not good probably um so that's all cautionary tale to those of you who fall for marketing campaigns we are so skeptical of everything well can you blame us that people get we get screwed constantly look at the campaign behind uh, behind watchdogs that game I just was, don't that game see was any showed of these... off in 2013 and we were like oh my god this is the next generation of games and then it came out and you couldn't even drive like you couldn't control the car and it was like oh so it's just a game that sucks just like all the other games I just I just look at these games that are coming out and I shake my head because what's in place is it's not good for the consumer, yet the consumers are they're, – they're eating it up. And, um, I mean, sort of like back in the Xbox, PlayStation 2, GameCube days where they started releasing these limited edition games um, with just like a little bit of extra content for another $10, $20. Like Resident Evil It was 4, an experiment wait, to wait. see if you would pay – sixty dollars instead of fifty dollars so now we're he here paying sixty dollars instead of fifty dollars we've got the season passes getting added on um these ultimate special editions that are getting bumped up from sixty dollars to eighty dollars the season passes bumping it up from sixty dollars to 110 dollars and just this is this is what we're going down. It's, it's and funny. I, I just hope people realize that when they're spending this money, this is what they are saying. They're they're, they're sending a, to you pay. were sending a message saying it is okay. Uh, yeah. And and you know what? It I, I so want to say it's not okay, but I I feel like there's a discussion to be had there. Season passes, are they okay? Uh, go ahead and leave a comment. That's a really interesting. We should discuss that on the next week's show season passes are if they okay. okay or not like, i like it dlc yeah. is it okay 
Uh, so go ahead and discuss that in the comments. I want to hear that. Um, Tell should... us what you think. Yeah. Um, speaking of, oh man, I I don't know if I want to go down this tangent. Well, because I'm playing Skyward Sword right now. You know me. I don't have much. I don't have much to say about this. I, I mean, so we wrote on our list Oculus Rift. What? It's releasing. So Oculus Rift is coming out on March 28th, which is as of the day of this. Less recording. than a week. It's like less than a week from now, right? Um, Did you know it was coming out? No, I had no idea. Like, yeah, you, you had no, no idea. Because you said you you put what it's releasing on the list, and I'm like, it what? When is it coming out? You're like a week from now, and I was like, really? I had no idea, no idea at all. Yeah. And uh, it's it's so why is it being swept under the rug if VR is the new big thing? Uh, I just, I don't know, and I have been very very skeptical of VR in the past to the point of obnoxiousness. I think, although most of the things I say are obnoxious. But um, but I, I just don't I don't think it's going to find a foothold. I don't think it's ready yet. I think the tech is still too expensive. I think most people don't really care. I think a lot of people that think it's it neat is mostly think that it's gimmicky. Uh, well, what surprises me is there's no real marketing push behind it. Um, Facebook bought this this uh, upcoming tech for the, the tune of two billion dollars. Um, and i mean yeah it's an expensive product it's a long-term investment for companies like facebook but <laughs> oh there goes my voice <laughs> but if um i mean they've already had they already have competitors sort of popping up in terms of like uh gear or not gear vr because gear vr is a subset of oculus um the htc vive and the playstation um, vr and the PlayStation VR, and yeah, the HTC Vive is going to be eight hundred dollars, whereas Oculus is six hundred. But that comes with the uh, controllers, or uh, the motion controllers that are part of it. Um, PlayStation VR, it's four hundred. But there's a bundle. Four hundred. There's the a bundle basic. for five hundred, but you can't actually buy the four hundred dollar. You have to buy the bundle, and it's it's Sony's way of being like, yeah, we're gonna sell this at a loss, but we're gonna package in all this stuff that's gonna make it a little more profitable for us. And since we're so we're such a profitable like console maker, since we sell crap hardware for four hundred bucks, uh, we're gonna make money anyway. So yeah, I'm just I'm sort of a little surprised that there's no marketing push just because. Um, I told you I've tried the, um, I tried Gear VR specifically, uh, and it was. It was pretty mind blowing just. Like you, you, you will hit a moment when you try VR for the first time where you forget where you are. And when that moment hits, you're just like, it's a wow moment. I will say this. Your sense is just so overwhelmed that you're like, oh my gosh, like I am not here. I am not in this area. I'm not hearing these things. I'm somewhere else. Uh, So that is, that is sort of what, it relies on um i'm surprised there's not no marketing push saying just like go to this store try it out go to best buy try it out here um and yeah it's expensive but if it is a product that people are really excited about such as when the iphone first came out they'll buy it it doesn't matter what the price is that is correct they will buy it i i I completely agree but the problem is is that this is a young technology. It is still, it's too new. There, There's not even a group of people who are like early adopters. This is the first VR system ever, really, right? Yeah. I mean, and it's just, it's too soon. There's The market is not there. It's $800. The PSVR is 500 and- 600. What is? Oh, the, oh that's right. The, the, the other one is 800. Uh, and then the PS is, is 500. It's just, I, I don't see it being successful out of the gate and that that's great for everyone who tries it and loves it and has fun with it that's fine i'm not ready to buy in because i don't feel like the install base is going to be there for it to reach a point of uh of being mainstream to the point where they're actually making games that i want to play for it Uh, and that's really the most important thing right is we're playing games because there's games we want to play and for me you know i don't see games like the witness being released on vr although i think that would be really cool they, there's no like big horror game that's that i've seen for vr which i think would be a really cool application uh mostly everything i've seen for vr is just tech demos and it's like that's fine but 
I don't really want to play Project Giant Robot on Wii U. I want to play an actual game. And I feel the same way about VR. So there you go. Uh, you should check out some of the horror games that have been I'm, sort of teased. I should like, say, um, I should say, I know, I'm sure they exist. I haven't seen one, uh, and that that's go just my check own. Check out Dread Halls, I believe it's so called. So that that's my own ignorance, and that's my fault. But at the same time, if I'm ignorant, then well, so, then no so is the public. So is the market. So you know. yeah, there there is no marketing for this, and that's the that's the big issue. Um, so, by the way, just an aside. If you were curious, the development kit for the um, Microsoft HoloLens, which is an augmented reality headset, that is, I believe it's like $2,000. Oh, my God. You, which, think, that, for, you for, think that's enough? For the dev kit. The, um, in, by contrast, the Oculus Rift um, dev kit, I believe, was only like $300, $400. So, Boy. Yeah. Quite the quite the jump, quite the price. investment uh, for those of you who believe in virtual reality as a legitimate medium. Uh, anyway, I, I think I think we should stop. I know I'm not hosting or anything, but yeah. I, I feel the need to steer this into the ground because I, my um, my voice is hanging on by a thread, man. It. Do you want to just go over real quick what you did beat this last? No, I want to die. Uh, actually, yeah, <laughs> I will. No, I will. I will say what I beat. Uh, I well. I didn't really beat anything, to be honest with you. I gave up on two games because I'm just like, these, these aren't very good. Mario and Luigi Dream Team, I gave a two out of five. I'm counting it for the 52-52. I played like you're done. I played 20 hours of that game. I do not feel guilty about putting it down. I hated every almost every moment of it. It was just it was it lacked all the charm and all the enjoyment I had just of a any, bad game. any previous Mario and Luigi game. I was so disappointed. I'm sure there's people out there who liked it, but I did not at all like that game. And the other one, um, I did replay the Zero Escape games because they uh, they showed that new trailer for the the third Zero Escape coming out this June. It's gonna be awesome. You guys should all check it out. Shout out to uh, Gideon at like underscore a underscore Gideon on uh, Twitter. Go follow him. He likes Zero Escape too. Uh, Nintendo nerd, all you guys. I love you guys. You guys are the best. So I played. I replayed those games, and I also re I also played uh, the Puzzle and Dragons Super Mario Brothers Edition for 3ds i didn't like it it it's like candy crush and it's like pokemon troze uh it's like an rpg it's like a puzzle game but ultimately all those things together just makes a convoluted mess which some people are convinced is a puzzle game i call it a random like a random luck type game with some rpg elements in it and it's it is and I want, I so wanted to like it because I was really enjoying it. And then it's just like, this game's too hard. The difficulty curve is insane. You don't, there's not really a way to strategize. It's not a difficulty it. curve though. It's just like Candy Crush. It's artificial difficulty yes. because it's a random type of game. Yes. And I so wanted to like it. And I'm so sad that I didn't because I spent a lot of money on it. But, but you know what? It, it's, it was all right for the, like, I probably played like 10 or 15 hours. I gave it a three out of five because it's enjoyable. Like it's fun. I had fun, but at one point it's just like, why am I doing this same level over and over again? I cannot get past it. I cannot strategize any better than I currently am in my current state of mind. So I just couldn't play it anymore. So I gave up on it. Uh, and yeah. I, I don't really feel bad about it. I don't really feel, I feel like I got enough enjoyment out of it to be like, yeah, I don't really need to play it anymore. So I beat um, puzzle and dragons, quote unquote. So Yeah. I need to get into the, the virtual virtues last reward series at some point. It's called Zero like. Escape. Virtues Last Rewards is the second game. Come okay. on, man. Ah, uh, whatever. Well, you know what, man. Whatever. Hey, I'm gonna bring you nine nine nine. If you haven't played it by the time I get there next month, I'm bringing it in my 3ds, and you're going to play at least the first like ending. And if you don't like it, you never have to touch it again. But I think you'll be hooked. Okay, that's all I have to say. Well, I do really like good stories. Um. I mean, have you played the Phoenix Wright games? Well, you played, yeah, them? yeah, and you played Danganronpa, right? And you liked it. Um, I, I started Danganronpa too. I got distracted for whatever reason, but what I did play was it was interesting enough. It was, I think I just should have just focused on the story part of the game. Um, I got, I started getting into the other like, oh, talk to the characters in the game and develop your relationship. No, no, with no, them. no, no just get... just use a guide for that stuff. It's not important, and it's the same. Yeah, yeah. that. Ugh, it, the. But like the actual mystery part of it was so was really really cool. Yeah. I got through like the first mystery of um, 
who was killed and just it was awesome and you don't really Absolutely have a lot it. of that ancillary stuff in in 999 it's it's pretty straightforward um um yeah so only other thing i played and i mean this could practically call be call, part of um my quest for mobile glory except this is a game that you buy um and that is and it was originally a pc game too it is pop caps plants versus zombies so shout out to dan because I know that he always likes, or he has mentioned Plants vs. Zombies as a great mobile game. And, you know, for the most part, Plants vs. Zombies is a really, really enjoyable um, tower defense game. I, I guess that's essentially what it is. It's a tower defense game. And I think everyone knows Plants vs. Zombies, right? Most people Even should. people who've never played it probably know about it. It has really good brand power. Yeah, but not good it, it enough. Not good enough brand point. power to get Garden Warfare Two to sell any any units, right? I thought you said Garden Warfare Two was doing well. Well, it, it sold four hundred thousand between the two systems, but it's like I don't know. It felt kind of underwhelming. It was sort of like a did like did you even know that the game had come out until I told you about it? Um, I think I had heard about it. Yeah, so I don't know. It's, it was kind of an underwhelming release. I'm not sweeping 500, almost 500,000 units under the rug or anything, but I'm just saying that it doesn't quite seem like it's going to be as successful as the first Garden Warfare was. Anyway, that, that's it. We can't do any more. Yeah, I'm so um, I'll be real quick about Plants vs. Zombies. It is a, it, it's a great game. It's a great tower defense game. I like good tower defense games. Um, I mean, like, even like a simple tower defense game thrown into a game like into another game like a uh, 3D dot game heroes i think of it i sort of get hooked on them for a little bit and that was sort of the case with plants vs zombies i sort of got hooked on it for a little bit i got through the main campaign and then i wanted to do the other mini games that are a part of it like there's a puzzle um, or there are puzzle mini games or just regular mini games and that is when the free-to-play mechanics actually started to kick in, um, where you would have to collect a certain amount of money in order to buy these um, packs of mini games. And either, yeah, you can spend money to get coins, or you can earn it through like your Zen Garden or just playing the game normally, but the way you get money in that is so slow. I have actually probably spent way too much time just wasting my life doing the endless mode in Plants vs. Zombies. Better spending um, time than money. Although one could make the argument that time is money. So, yeah. So Speaking of which, we should probably go because we wasted a lot of people's time and a lot of people's money. True. Well, with that said, Plants vs. Zombies, I will give it, I'll give it a 4 out of 5 because, like, yeah, you – when it first came out, I think it was like a twenty dollars game. I think now it's ten dollars on bad. most stores. Not you can bad. usually get it on sale for less. Um, Amazon actually sometimes gives it out for free. Um, I have an, so yeah, I like have an that. assignment for you, by the way, for your quest for Mobile Glory. What I want you to play Me Tomo this week and give a report on it when we come back. It will it will it be out? I imagine so. That Nintendo said it was going to be out in March in in America. So I want to play it. I want to try it out. I want, so I, I, yeah. I'm just going to say, yeah, Plants vs. Zombies 4 to 5, um, and then the free-to-play mechanism stuff starts kicking into gear, and that's horrible, as all free-to-play kind of mini or mobile content is. But it comes with a real game where you actually build up and do harder and harder things, and uh, it takes a little bit of skill. So that's a good thing in games. That's it. Are we done? Ooh, I can't believe I made it through this whole thing. <laughs> I really yes, can't. Uh, this, so, this episode was like what we're, we're approaching 75 minutes here so i think this is a good good chunk for for you guys who have missed us and for those of you who haven't well go screw go play the division <laughs> no i wouldn't even actually, i wouldn't advise anybody actually to this that. is like almost a perfect uh podcast to listen to while you play the division yeah because it's so brainless it. you can pay attention to what we're saying and and what since what we're saying is so brainless, you can pay attention to the game at the same time. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, it's a match made in heaven. Maybe All right, maybe so hell. For Doctor Spiegel, I am Mister Piddle, and this was effortless. Have a good one, everybody. Yay.